Good evening and welcome. I'm Clara Arakasami and the president of ICOMOS UK. Today's event, Ethical Standards in Interdisciplinary Heritage, Barriers or Bonuses, launches our new education, training and events committee. Sean O'Reilly was appointed chair and tasked with the responsibility of setting up a new committee to replace our old one with two additional functions to it, education and events. However, COVID got in the way, delaying its work. So I'm pleased to announce this evening that the new committee is now in place with new terms of reference reflecting ICOMOS UK's strategic aspirations. As I see it, the topic today presents three key elements. Interdisciplinary approach to conservation of heritage, the ethical considerations associated with it, and regulation of ethics. I'm sure you will agree with me that we have witnessed a significant amount of debate about the differences between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches and their relevance in the area of conservation in the past. We are now adding ethics and regulation into the mix. And of course, we must not forget there are other critical issues that need addressing too. For example, the ethics of integrating integration of emerging and live issues relating to Britain's dark past, such as its colonial history, people-centered or rights-based approaches, conservation of indigenous heritage into education and training policies and activities. An understanding of these topics is essential when we work with culturally diverse communities at home and abroad and with international projects. It will help us not to transplant wholesale our models in another cultural environment. We also need to factor in the needs of emerging professionals, young people entering the conservation field who are hungry for change and new ways of working. I'm sure that the panel comprising our new committee members who have been in the field of education and training for a significant period of time are well positioned to address some of these topics from their own perspectives. It is important to state we don't have all the answers, but the questions raised this evening will give us all an opportunity to search for appropriate answers. Therefore, your contribution is equally important. As a standard setter, ICOMOS International, our parent body, has produced many diverse doctrinal texts on conservation, and we at ICOMOS UK would like to try and make these accessible to our members and non-members. We would also like to create our own doctrines for national use. However, we need to constantly remind ourselves we are primarily a volunteer-led organization with a small staff resource, and therefore we'll need to take a realistic approach to this. We have one hour for this event, so it will help if you could keep your intervention short so that many more participants have the opportunity to contribute. Please write your questions in the chat box for our Q&A session at the end. We are keeping this session, on the request of Sean, we're keeping this session fairly informal. So I'm going to hand this over to Sean, who is the Chief Executive of the Institute of Heritage Building Conservation, which is a membership organization, to start the evening with his presentation. He will also be introducing other panel members. Finally, I'd like to thank Sean and the committee members for their effort to date in successfully establishing a new education training and events committee for ECOMOS UK. Sean, over to you. Many thanks, Clara. Um, I'm Sean O'Reilly, chair of the subcommittee, as Clara has pointed out, and director of the Institute of Historic Building Conservation. Uh, personal details are linked on LinkedIn, uh, professional ones on our website. And as she said, we're all briefly introducing aspects of our own work tonight to help people get to know the committee, but also to help people uh, advise us on how they want the committee to shape its future. Um, for my uh, introduction tonight, um, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the work that I get involved with, with the IHBC. Again, a number of the references will be on the website, but we can send stuff out later if people are interested in that as well. So my topic is managing interdisciplinary practice standards in a professional body. Um, and, and the starting point for that is of course the reference uh, for the, from the 1993 ECOMOS guidelines, which talks about the practice of 
conservation being interdisciplinary. Um, and there are lots of words, as Clara mentioned, around that. But fundamentally, it talks about this idea of moving beyond the primary discipline that one might have uh, uh, trained in. Now, the IHBC represents interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary conservation practice and practitioners across the UK. We've got nearly 3,000 members, about 1,200 accredited, and they come from and indeed beyond all the traditional and mainstream professional practice areas from archaeology and history through planning to architecture, engineering, construction, very wide base in those terms. The core standard, uh, practice standard for managing um, ethical issues is our code of conduct. And again, that's on the web website. This talks about um, members of being required to observe what it describes as the highest standards of ethical and responsible behavior in the conduct of conservation. It also requires members uh, not to discriminate um, and to seek to eliminate such discrimination and to promote uh, equality of opportunity. So very wide ranging ethical frameworks. But like I say, the focus for me tonight is on the practice standards and um, uh, the regulatory frameworks that we operate, uh, given our priorities around this interdisciplinary practice. Um, there's two challenges I'd like to highlight first uh, in terms of how we uh, manage practice standards and encourage what is described as the highest standards of ethical and responsible behavior in conservation. Um, the two particular areas are assessment, uh, and then I'll look at the regulatory side. And these are all brief brief introductions. I'm not doing anything more than outlining the framework of thinking that we use. There's lots more detail underpinning these. For the assessment, there's uh, uh, two key models or frameworks that we use, the IHBC competences, and then the linked conservation cycle, which is based on those eight IHBC competences. The competences themselves are practice areas that range across disciplines and uh, activities from research and uh, investigation right across through planning and management and into design and uh, communication areas. And these reflect the broad spread of the ICOMOS guidelines from 93 and, 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 and its successors, uh, uh, its extensions as well. The competences also reflect a map to the model conservation cycle, which embodies the guidelines, but also extends from them because it looks more widely than the competences. What the conservation cycle does is actually join all these practice areas together. It offers a model which allows for the linking of those uh, different practice areas. By using the competences and the area and the conservation cycle with its areas of competence, that allows us to manage regulatory and uh, controls and practice standards in our own terms, but still being tied to the 1993 guidelines and, and, and indeed paying homage to the, the huge strengths there as well. Um, so that's the assessment tools. The assessment process, recognizing that it complements those tools. The process requires that anyone applying for IHBC accreditation demonstrate their abilities across all the competences and the practice areas represented in the uh, uh, conservation cycle. And that's where we sort of ask people to uh, prove their interdisciplinary capacity because you're working, showing you have a competence across these different areas. Not that you're totally expert in all of them, but you have a faculty, a, 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 an appropriate standard of practice for uh, each of them considered holistically. That assessment is carried out by IHBC members with different uh, and balanced primary disciplines, uh, again, ranging from the likes of history up to design and architecture. Um, and the, this ensures that the assessment process is structurally interdisciplinary too. The other side of um, that in terms of the challenges is regulation. There as noted as our key uh, tool, the code of conduct. 
that's applied specifically to disciplinary cases. Um, and the process, as you would expect, is based on a submitted complaint, which is then assessed on its own terms. And we do the pra standard practice of uh, managing these uh, issues like complaints through resources and processing, reviewing evidence and all of that. But also um, we manage those uh, uh, processes with members with a similar diversity of primary disciplines, again, to embed that interdisciplinary practice in it. Um, for managing that, uh, those standards, there are two critical aspects of conservation that we look at. First of all is the conservation outcomes, what happened? Um, and that's in line with our charitable objectives very clearly. But for interdisciplinary practice, there's a less formal aspect that we have to consider, and that is conservation intent. As practitioners, conservation professionals, as interdisciplinary practitioners are typically working in teams. And that's a fundamental part of the 93 guidelines as well. So the actual outcomes are inevitably shaped by factors outside their control. So we have to bring that into bear on the system too. Um, we also have various tools supporting these practice standards. They have particular characteristics tending to be focused on general principles as with our conservation professional practice principles, and also um, to be pretty selective in topic and generic in content. And you'll see aspects of those in our toolbox and our self-starter, which are also linked from the website. Um, it is actually all simpler than you might expect when you have this infrastructure uh, in place. And we've typically very little disagreement amongst members on practice standards um, and ethical behavior. Um, so I'll uh, leave it at that as, as it is and pass over to Atta, who's the uh, uh, subcommittee vice chair, uh, to introduce her background and uh, her topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sean, can you hear me? Because yes, we can. We can hear okay. you, see you, and we can see the slides as well. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, can you still see the slides now? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, um, everyone, for coming, and uh, thank you, Sean, for this uh, introduction. Uh, as Sean said, uh, I am currently serving as the vice chair. Uh, of the e-commerce UK ETE committee, new established committee. Uh, I am also uh, a lecturer now currently uh, in architecture and urban heritage at the Liverpool School of Architecture. Uh, my research is around uh, heritage-led sustainable urban regeneration, particularly in post-conflict reconstruction and reconciliation. Uh, I've uh, recently established and currently directing an MA in Sustainable Heritage Management, which is fully recognized by the Institute of Historic Building Conservation. Uh, I also co-established a research-led design studio in uh, BA3 at the Liverpool School of Architecture. I'm also currently uh, co-supervising seven PhD students. Uh, and also, I would like to mention that I am a member of the Ethics Committee at the University of Liverpool uh, School of the Arts. Uh, and recently, uh, I, am, uh, I have been serving also as a member of the University of Liverpool Senate. Uh, I would like to mention that today, uh, I'm going to highlight two issues in relation to ethical standards in heritage higher education and uh, in the field as well, with particular focus on vulnerable people, such as children and displaced communities. Of course, there is no doubt that ethical standards shape our practice as educators, researchers, and heritage practitioners. However, as an educator and as a researcher, I, fa I face the challenge of submitting long applications, uh, besides sometimes encountering uh, encountering minimal background knowledge among the majority of our postgraduate students and sometimes even colleagues. Uh, this might occasionally lead to less effective application of ethical standards in practice, uh, such as, for example, during interviews or 
particularly when really dealing with a complex socio-cultural context or, for example, with uh, displaced communities. Uh, therefore, um, you know, some questions really, um, you know, uh, they are how could we make the process of ethical approval less time consuming in academia and more effective in practice? Uh, where is the gap? Is it uh, in the strategy of education and training? Or uh, is it the dichotomy between theory and practice of ethics? that impacts upon our professional practice, or is it something else? Another important question is how could we impact or change ethical policies to be more effective in practice uh, by drawing on from our particular experience, especially when dealing with vulnerable communities, such as displaced people or children, uh, mainly during our discussion with them about their intangible heritage, which has also been uprooted with them. Um, actually, from recent uh, experience, I learned that we do need a high level of ethical consideration when dealing with such community, but at the same time, we do need to simplify the process and find better ways to go to get our consent and to provide the community with a better understanding of their uh, ethical rights. So I really would like to open the discussion uh, uh, to the audience and uh, uh, all of you are welcome with, to uh, raise your questions or discuss them with us. Uh, and also I would like now to pass on to my colleague, Evelyn uh, Godfrey, who is part of the committee as well. Thank you. Hi, um, sorry, I uh, took a while to <laughs> turn on the video. My name is Evelyn Godfrey. I'm a um, professional archaeological and conservation scientist. And uh, right now I'm teaching at a university. Right now I'm teaching at a, a university in um, Atlantic Canada. So because I'm in uh, Canada, I am going to start uh, with a land acknowledgement. So I am sat here today in Mi'kma'ki, which is the country of the Mi'kmaq First Nations. And this land was never legally ceded by the Mi'kmaq people to either the government of Great Britain or the government of Canada. So I'm just going to share some slides. Okay. So in uh, December 2020, I published a paper in, on um, decolonization, which is a subject that um, I've been um, involved with for the past sort of um, uh, four or five years. And um, what the point I was making in this um, Time to Rethink Buried Treasure paper, and here's an abstract of the abstract, <laughs> is that um, the contemporary decolonization movement really requires us to make an ethical reconsideration of ownership, the ownership of um, sites and objects. And alongside that, uh, control of the um, archaeological narrative and the um, historical narrative. So what I'm suggesting in the paper is that um, archaeological and ethnographic material should be defined in law as the patrimony of the local community and should be held in uh, public ownership or stewardship uh, within that uh, country, the country where it was um, made or found. And this is an issue uh, for me as a, as a British archeologist, uh, because in England today, there is no um, legal requirement to um, get a permit to excavate, and there's no license required to go metal detecting, for example, and that's why I'm talking about treasure here. Um, all you need is the landowner's um, permission. And what's more than that, in England and the US and, and uh, many countries, it's legal for dealers and auction houses to, um, to trade in, in archeological uh, material. 
so this is um, things in, in old collections, but also in as long as you can prove that it wasn't stolen, uh, recently excavated archaeological uh, material. So I, I've got involved um, with this whole subject because I, I sit on the committee on um, illicit trade and cultural material of the European Association of Archaeologists. And there's a link to our, our website there. And we were talking initially about um, things that had been stolen and things that had been excavated in, in countries that um, do have laws that um, uh, prevent people from from digging things up and um, taking them taking them away, which a lot of countries do have strong archaeological heritage laws, and obviously not including Britain. Um, and then we started thinking, well, what about the the material that the collectors say was legally acquired? So the big example of that is the Parthenon marbles in the British Museum. What do you do with archaeological material that the current owners say they acquired legally, but the country from which the material came is insisting that it is their patrimony and it should be um, repatriated to them. There we're not talking about illicit trade, there we start to talk about an, an ethical issue about ownership of um, uh, cultural materials. So we've actually started expanding our interests beyond um, just the illicit trade in the sense of things, of things that are technically illegal and started thinking about what is ethical in, in terms of um, collecting. And so we have been working on a code of ethics for um, the analysis and examination of archeological material in, in particular, just because we're all archeological scientists on, on this um, uh, committee. Wider than that, there's a discussion going on in, in the whole European Association of Archaeologists on rewriting the um, code of practice, uh, the, the code of practice and um, the codes of conduct. And so I'm involved in the task force of the EAA that's um, writing what we're now calling a code of ethics. And the reason why we're calling it ethics now instead of practice is because we are trying to find common ground about things that we as heritage professionals agree are right and wrong. So, it, so it's, a, it's not a matter of individual countries, people from individual countries talking about what is the law in their country because that will of course vary uh, according to the nation. And so it's not laws and it's not um, a set of um, uh, practice that, that we're talking about here. It's, it's identifying what we as heritage professionals in any country can agree is right and wrong in, in um, professional um, practice. And so that's why we're talking about ethics now and, and the new code will be called uh, a code of ethics instead of a, a code of practice. And um, I want to give one example of uh, World Heritage Sites in, in Canada. Um, so there are um, eight cultural World Heritage Sites in, in Canada. And four of those are actually in the region where I am now, Atlantic um, Canada. Um, so, the, so of these eight, um, the four that are in Atlantic Canada are Lonceau Meadow in Newfoundland, uh, so number one, and number four, Old Lunenburg in Nova Scotia, and number eight, the whaling station in Labrador, and number seven, another one in Nova Scotia. All of those sites you will see have the European association. So Lonceau Meadow is, is a, a Viking overwintering site. Um, the Basque whaling station is obviously a Basque whaling station. Old Town Lunenburg is a, is a, a, a European settler um, site in, in Nova Scotia. The one I'd like to, to focus on is a relatively recently approved uh, World Heritage Site from 2012, the second one in Nova Scotia, and it's again a European site, the landscape of Grand Pré, which uh, memorializes French settlers as opposed to other European um, settlers uh, coming to North America. The, the point is, these are all European um, World Heritage Sites. There is not a single First Nations Indigenous World Heritage Site in, in the entire Atlantic region. 
And of these, only two are indigenous uh, sites, one in British Columbia and one in Alberta and the west of, of Canada, which is farther away from here than England is. And um, why this is a travesty in Mi'kma'ki in particular, in, in uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, is that there is a um, major site in um, Nova Scotia at DeBert that was identified already in the 1940s. We know it's all very important. And there was a World Heritage Site bid launched by the, um, the uh, local Mi'kmaq First Nation uh, back in, in 2010 in, in order to try and get inscribed on, on the, the list in 2012. So this is a very important site. It is the oldest dated indigenous site in Eastern Canada. So it dates from around 9,000 BC. So, so it, it dates from very near when people first entered North America after the end of the last ice age. And, and, and it is enormous. The earliest professional excavations that were ever undertaken in Eastern Canada were actually um, done at the prehistoric Mi'kmaq sites in 1917-18. So there is a big assemblage of very important early archaeological material uh, from, from this area. And those artifacts were sent to the Pitt Rivers Museum during the Second World War, where they have stayed for the past 80 years in, in storage and, and never displayed. Um, so there is a repatriation um, issue uh, to be had there. Um, why didn't uh, that site get inscribed in 2012 because the government of Nova Scotia at the time, which is obviously all run by European descent um, people, decided um, to give a big donation to the, to the alternative bid, like millions of dollars in, in support for the alternative bid to inscribe a French uh, colonial site, the, the landscape of Grand Pre. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is that we need to be asking ethical questions in order to counteract these local political um, issues that come up when, when we're talking about inscribing um, world heritage sites. Uh, so for example, asking whose heritage is it? Who's responsible for, for maintaining that? And how are um, things like local politics and, and religion um, influencing attitudes? And um, what are the conservation uh, methods that are going to be um, used? So I, I think I've probably used up my, my five um, minutes now. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm going to hand over to Eileen um, to, to speak next. I think I'm handing over to Eileen. <laughs> okay, someone needs to turn my video on. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah it's, it was turned off by the host. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me doing it. Yeah, say, yeah. Could you turn my video on, please? Well, I could probably have done it without you seeing me um, as well, but uh, good evening and it's good to be here and, and good to be part of this discussion. Um, I'm Eileen Orbashla and I'm both an academic and a practitioner, and that's what I really want to focus on when we think about ethics. So as an academic, I apply for ethics approval. So I go through the processes that Atta sort of articulated for you um, and go through um, and also um, support um, my research students as they apply for ethics approval. Obviously, in my own research, I apply those um, ethics principles and make sure uh, I work to those standards. In other roles, I assess and rec make recommendations on other people's ethics uh, proposals. So look at and, and help them make sure their projects, um, and let's call it ethically viable, um, are considerate um, in their approaches and, and taking on many different approach, uh, aspects of it. At the same time, I work as a practitioner where there aren't the same processes of, of ethics. Um, I am aware of them. I'm aware of them in particular because of my academic job. But apart from codes of conduct, good practice, principles, there is actually no process of considering whether the projects I'm working on are following good ethical guidance. And one thing that happens in academia is that the process is very nuanced. Um, 
to be able to fill in the form, you have to justify all the methods you're using. So you think about it, you hone them, uh, you might take out parts that don't feel right or, you know, through discussion, alter your behavior, alter your approach and all the rest. So there's a long process between those approving, advising and those applying. So it makes the researcher in this case really think about um, what their ethical, you know, about ethics. It's not just something that's taught in the classroom. It's something they have to make sure is part of and parcel and integrated into that research. Yet, as practitioners, we have much limited awareness of that and we go out onto site and quite often in the work we do, we are working with vulnerable people. At times, we're not even aware that we're working with uh, vulnerable people. We might be working with vulnerable communities, we might be working with indigenous communities, we might be working with um, people who have different values and quite often we're quite honestly unaware of those values. Um, and I'm not talking necessarily even here of going into Aboriginal settlements in Australia. I'm talking about Hackney, for example, in London and, and working with people with multiple backgrounds, the way they feel about an area. And yet, you know, as architects, archeologists, heritage managers, interpretation specialists, we can find ourselves in positions where we are working with these communities. We are making judgments on their values. Um, either assumptions on their values and what they feel. Um, we are or we're not um, knowingly and unknowingly, maybe not considering their feelings um, towards something. Um, for many years in the 90s, I was the project architect for the Jeffrey Museum um, in Hackney. And obviously these days there's a big debate and the name of the museum has just been changed to the Museum of the Home uh, because Sir Robert Jeffrey, who was the founding uh, father of these almshouses, it turns out to be making his money on the slave trade. Um, and there was already a, a big, you know, and again, it comes to light that the particularly um, parts of the community living in the area found it this very offensive, but this was never taken on board. It's not thought about, it's not, you know, and there is no, the key point is that there is little process that makes um, the, the practitioner think about implications or processes as they're going through and making decisions. Again, you know, a young architect, you know, in, new in a practice might find themselves being sent off to an evening meeting on a council estate to discuss a regeneration or refurbishment program again totally unarmed um you know and there will be vulnerable people in that, that audience you know how do you reach them how do you communicate with them they might be speaking different languages you know all these things if you were doing it as an academic research project you would have sort of checkpoints and the sort of guards in place and, and none of that happens we just go in and say it's a, a you've drawn the short straw and having to go to this event at night and uh, one evening and, and so on so i think you know there is this big chasm between the good practices that are emerging and being uh, developed um in the more academic environment and how this can translate into you know better awareness in practice i don't think it's um, terribly practical to bring in, you know, and I think Atta already said, you know, the difficulties of, um, of, sort of the process and the approval processes and all that, but how do we make professionals working in cultural heritage and indeed other disciplines more aw aware of their responsibilities uh, to the communities around them, people they work with and others that might be affected that we don't even take on board because we feel we're making decisions about the sort of very tangible physical um, piece of heritage rather than the sort of bigger picture like and what th how things might impact on a bigger community even if they're not perceived as, as part of that project so it's more a question um, you know we have these awarenesses we have much tighter deadlines um, in, in practice and, and sort of how can we merge the two or sort of bring the two sides um, together. Um, Sean talked about sort of professional conduct and things like, you know, it's not necessarily about sort of slapping people on wrist. And, and, and again, many of these vulnerable communities will not be the people who will come forward and say, well, this was poor professional conduct um, on your part, etc. So 
think how can we uh, make it practice become more aware um, in their application sort of going forward so that I sort of basically this is the sort of question I want to put on the table and, and again I'd very well much welcome um, comments and thoughts um, you might have including on the practicalities of that process but now it's my great pleasure to, to pass on to the secretary um, of the committee Noor Raghavan who's going to talk to us about her own experiences as a PhD student Thank you, Aileen. So hi, everyone. I'm Noor Regaban. I'm a sub, oh, sorry. I forgot to share my screen. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm a Saudi PhD student at the University of Liverpool School of Architecture, currently researching homes in the city of Jeddah, while considering a slightly different approach from that uh, previously followed investigating Saudi homes. My methods stro strongly depend on inhabitants' narratives to truly understand the diverse lived-in experience that makes each home unique, and mainly to shed light on an under-discussed topic, that, and that is gender segregation, or in fact mixing, and how it affects the way dwellings are analyzed, and so how they work. The methods are mainly interviews, observations, mapping, surveying, and auto photography. I will talk about some barriers and bound. Uh, and bonuses of ethics from my recent experience um, as points to be followed in the future. They're somewhat similar to uh, what Dr. Atta and Aylin have mentioned already. So in terms of barriers, as a Saudi Jeddawi female from Jeddah and only targeting Jeddawi participants, the methods were greatly welcomed um, as families know each other. Not much the surveying though, however, uh, through consent, uh, the thorough consent form that required signature were very intimidating and off-putting to many uh, participants, regardless to their education and level. The explanation of data handling and sorting was uh, the most intimidating, and they had to be part of the consent forms. It was not optional to just remove them. Due to privacy and security reasons, participant names and exact home location, of course, were not collected and the participants were assured of that in, the, in that same consent form. Thus, the participants have found that conflicting. They were surprised that there is so much detail about the data collection and uh, privacy, and then the fact that we're not collecting private uh, data. Also, as Dr. Atas mentioned, the length of consent forms was off-putting. While people are aware th that these interviews were part of, res uh, of a research, they perceived it very friendly. And they, uh, they view it, viewed it as a friendly talk rather than a uh, formal interview. However, the consent forms made it very formal and rigid. Uh, thus, it was not suitable for the environment. And by environment, I mean the houses, since most of the interviews and observations were done in houses. In a Saudi context, if you're in someone's house, they're being very, uh, uh, showing so much hospitality and they just want you to be there and be friendly. You can't go there on a formal interview, really. So um, the paper signing was very uncomfortable to them. And having to go through it with almost every, part, uh, almost every participant was very time consuming of the interview time. Though their initial response is often just to sign it or have me sign it, actually. Um, they still did not like it because they've given their verbal consent and they expect me to respect that. So I would say it was really not, was not the best solution for that context. Another barrier was the uh, ethical application, filling and process time. I must admit, uh, as Aileen has mentioned, that through the process, you are thinking of the methodology and every detail. So it did help me a lot writing the methodology chapter. However, the waiting time for feedback and approval consumed a lot of time of, re uh, of the research. And I believe many of you are aware that we are not, uh, we don't have much time during research. And that was my primary uh, data source. Moving to the uh, bonuses, I've learned from the various uh, participants that there are various ways of obtaining consents besides the, uh, the typical signed form. Of course, this may not be applicable for other research projects or uh, auto photography method in particular, 
but flexibility should be considered as, uh, as per the cases and projects. Also, as ethics applications are not very popular in Saudi, uh, I felt that I've participated in raising awareness about research ethics and so participants' right. So I hope that I can really contribute to that process in the future and see ethics being more for, uh, flexible and uh, adaptable to different cultures and contexts. And that was it for me. And I think I'll hand uh, the mic to Clara or Sean. Anthea? Hello. Um... Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Gosh, so many issues. I mean, you know, it's one, one of the areas as, as communities are changing and, and the world is changing and th there is more demand for participation from communities. Those people we are researching into, those people that, you know, whose heritage we are digging uh, and the ownership who owns uh, the, those, uh, the, the, these heritages. Uh, these are very complex issues. There's no simple answer to it. Um, so it's a broad <laughs> spectrum of issues. Gosh, in one evening, I don't think we can answer all of it, but we'll try to answer some of it. And thank you to the presenters for raising such critical and very interesting scenarios and issues.